going on, everybody? Welcome to Doppler's. Gear Garage. Happy Saturday to you. All right, first of all, welcome, 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 welcome. I see some happy people out there in Saturday land. Well, you know what time it is. There we go. It is time to, ladies and gentlemen, raise them up. Come on. So let me know what it is that you're drinking down there in the comments. I'm doing my usual protein drink with a few shots of espresso. Mmm. Mm. Excellent, excellent. I'm ready to go. So we have got a show for you. First of all, on Let's Jam, we're going to be talking about Mixolydian mode. A Mixolydian. We are also going to be doing something new today. Yes, pedals and boards, because in the true spirit of Doppler's Gear Garage, if we're not talking about pedals and boards and gear, what kind of gear garage is this actually, right? So we're going to get a chance to hang out and do some of that. Uh, I also uh, have, obviously, we always do a little bit of Q&A because that's important. And I also always like to say hello, Braden. Is it Braden or Braden? I think it's Braden. Can you clarify that for me? Because I should know that. And I probably asked that before. Chris Alexander, hello. Jim Halbert, hello. Happy Easter to you, my friend. I uh, hear you are in mixolydian this. And thank you for coming, my friend. Black Heel Fields Productions. All right. Hey, what's going on, my man? Great to see you. Hang on a second. I know your first name. Hang on just one second. Let me just get up here in my inbox because I want to welcome a new friend to the show. Where are you? There we go. Come on. I know it's in here. Um, so I had, had a, a, a new kind of friend reach out. Uh, there we go. Noah, there we go. Noah, welcome aboard. Noah reached out for uh, inquiring about some lessons locally, and I let him know that I am actually only teaching via this internet sort of thing, but uh, we exchange a few emails. In any case, welcome to the show. Great to see you. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Melissa Doppler, the woman that keeps things going in the house of Doppler. Paul Richard, hello, my friend. Great to see you. Jerry, the vegan rock star, 2011. Sunny and unreasonably warm here today. I love that. Excellent, excellent. It's pronounced... Braden. So I did kind of get that right half the time. All right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. All right. Well, everybody, first of all, uh, one of the things is I'm not going to be here next week. I will hopefully be here the week after. Uh, next week, I'm going to New York City because I'm going to go see Steve Vai and Joe Satriani, which, hey, Steve Corral, what's going on, my man? Great to see you. Hello. 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 Steve, your amp is sitting over there Safe and sound. Nice guitar pick, by the way. So in any case, um, here's the deal. One of the things that is near and dear to my heart is talking about how I can help other guitar players become better guitar players. So the Mixolydian bit, uh, we're going to push a little bit further back in the broadcast here simply because... I want to make sure that at the front end of this, anybody that's watching now or is re-watching, uh, they can kind of get maybe the largest amount of stuff that's beneficial to the largest amount of people. Uh, so one of the things that has happened is I've had a number of people reaching out with gear-related questions, a bunch of re which relates to pedal boards and so on and so forth. So um, in the framework of all of that, we're going to head right over to here to... Gosh darn it. There we go. Pedals and boards. All right. So let's get over here. There we go. So the deal is, uh, this is kind of a new pedal board that I'm putting together. And uh, my old student guy reached out this week. And we've been kind of exchanging messages back and forth 
about using multiple lamps. And so one of the things that's new on my board here is a Mesa Boogie switch track. And so the deal is this guy is going to enable me to switch between, wait for it, multiple amps. Uh, but part of the conversation that Guy and I had was about using multiple amps. So we'll get to that in a moment. But the other part of it was also talking about 9 volts and 18 volts. And I realized there's a bunch that people maybe don't necessarily know about pedals and power and all of that. So I wanted to take a moment and quickly talk about that. Uh, as you can see on said pedal board here, uh, I've not wired this puppy up yet, but there are a couple of things about signal chain that are generally how I like to do things, and I figured I'd share them with you as well as a couple of other tips uh, and answer any questions that happen along the way. Uh, this is the Origin Effects stacked compressor. Uh, it's the Cali 76 stack compressor. Basically, got, it's a two-in-one beginning of the signal chain. I then go to... Uh, I go to the uh, <laughs> the Mesa Boogie Grid Slammer because generally I go to my overdrive before I go to my distortion. Uh, that is to say, I want to be able to, if I for some reason want to stack these guys, I generally prefer to stack an overdrive into a distortion versus the other way. In turn, this is a brand new pedal that has shown up that I am besides myself to try out. So chances are... In two weeks when we meet up, hey, Mark Turvey, great to see you, my friend. Uh, pleasure. I always appreciate that that salutation. Warms the heart uh, right back at you. So this brand new addition to my board here is actually going to be a great teaching point about one of the other subjects that we're going to talk about. Velcro. Boom. So one of the things that I, I have a tendency to do, and I don't think I have any pedals on the board that I've done that with, but when I get little feet like this on the bottom of a pedal like this, uh, generally these rubberized feet don't like to hold on to Velcro. So what ends up happening is you take, just like what happened here and what happened earlier, you start taking the, board, the pedal off the board and it starts leaving the Velcro on the board instead of on the pedal. What I did discover, kind of by a happy accident, is that the only one that didn't want to do that is this one that I kind of ran down like this, as I'm going to do with the rest of these. And so what it does now is have the majority of the surface area, because the way these guys are set up, these little rubber feet, which quite often I will take off and put on the side of the pedal somewhere, so I can easily know which feet went with which pedal. Usually, if you pull them off just once they have enough stick left to them, you can just put them on the side of the pedal. Uh, and in turn, uh, just doing this now is probably going to solve that problem. But now, because those guys are elevated, we've got the Velcro on there. But this pedal uh, it represents a couple of different things. One, this is just, if you're into the Leslie thing, I sat in with Taj Ferrant uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And his guitar player uh, it had the older version of this pedal. And uh, I, the moment he stepped on it, it was just one of those things that I just lost my mind. Chad Boston, what's going on? Great to see you, my man. Uh, hang on. Wait, 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 wait. Chad is from the, the Line 6 world, so it's not happening today. But I'm sure Chad knows all about this great little, little, little Pod Express. I was actually using this for a bunch of lessons a couple weeks ago. This thing is amazing. It will be here being featured in two weeks when I'm back. Great to see you. Thanks for showing up, my man. John Mello, love that guitar. Hello, hello. Okay, so the thing about this, all right, this, this one of these started to unfeet, if you will. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gently gonna shift this. So this end started to stick up. So the idea is as much of the surface as you can actually get on the paint. So what I'm doing here is I am just basically taking this guy, right angling it so I've got as much of this guy on the surface right there, and then in turn bring this down and then putting more back on the surface of this, this guy. And in theory, and one of the other things is give it a good going over with said thumbs, and that'll help seed it a little bit better. And hopefully, there we go, that'll keep the Velcro on the bottom there. Uh, we're also gonna talk about labels and Velcro in a moment, because when you go to resell a pedal, if you want to, the Velcro on the bottom can be a bit of an issue. 
Uh, so in any case, this Leslie pedal, uh, Nathan Bryce and Rolling Dice. Nathan is the second guitar player in Taj's band and also is the Nathan Bryce of Nathan Bryce and uh, uh, Loaded Dice, excuse me. And so he had the older version of this pedal. Like I said, he stepped on this thing. And if you dig that Leslie sound, hang on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Now there's a, there will be a section coming up. Have I really run off camera that early? Yes. Yes. Because I must. Because I have. I can't contain myself. The caffeine is kicked in, but wait, there's more. There is a reason for all of this because one of the segments we're going to be adding, hello, is going to be Doppler's Vintage Vault. And that right there is a Fender Vibratone. And for any of you Stevie Ray fanatics out there, you'll probably know that that was an integral part of Stevie's sound. Um, and so, you know, there's just so many track where he's got that going, used it live. So basically inside here, there is the model of that little guy. Uh, and basically the Vibratone uh, was manufactured by, you can see the Fender logo there, and it's just groovy. It's actually got a 10 inch speaker as opposed to a 12. Um, and as long as we're playing show and tell, gosh darn it. No, I can't get the revolver easily, but I've got a boogie revolver there. So like I am really into this whole spinning speaker thing. Uh, and so the great thing about this Leslie guy, there we go, no Velcro on the board there, uh, is that it's just obscenely great. Uh, so I am, I'm now Leslie uh, slash Hammond endorser. So uh, I'm going to be doing a video for this. And, you know, it's probably, I would have to say more than any other pedal that I've ever heard. When, when Nathan stepped on that thing, I just was like, because I watched, I was kind of standing next to him. I watched him step on it and the sound was just insane, which is, you're kind of like, well, why are you talking about it not playing? Because I haven't got, got it wired up yet. But the idea of, 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 and it is a little big, but, you know, it matters. Uh, uh, oh, Chad is venturing into custom pedal boards, plexiglass. I want to chat about it via PM. Uh, first of all, DougDopplerMusic at gmail.com. Bring it on, any and all, especially you, Chad. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Melissa Doppler, boy, she's fast with those fingers. All right, so let's talk about Velcro for a moment. A subject near and dear to my heart. Actually, you know, I'm, I'm going to do it again. I cannot resist. I cannot resist. So I am, I'm a labeler. Yep, I'm a labeler. I cannot, I cannot help myself because I, I just love to label stuff. And where did, where did my Velcro box go? And I'm a labeler and I'm a loser. I've lost my Velcro box. Well, you know, I could grab another box and pretend it's my Velcro box, but it wouldn't be it. I, I had it out this morning. In any case, gosh darn it. Really? It must be off somewhere. In any case, I have all these labeled boxes over there, and one of which is the giant box filled with all sorts of different types of, of Velcro. Uh, I generally have found that if it doesn't have too much stick to it, it's probably a good thing. This particular pedal has got the heavy duty, holy cow, if you accidentally leave it stuck to your floor, you're gonna wrestle with it. So it's actually a little overkill. It's because the Velcro on this board has been here for so long, it's not gonna pull it up. I should say the, um, what do they call it? Uh, the hook and fastener, whatever they call that. I should know the, the names of In any case, this guy is could be any pedal that you own. And ideally, when you go to put Velcro on this, you're kind of going, well, how do I actually do that? And so just as a couple of tips, the bottom here, uh, because when I went to put the big fat strip of Velcro on here, I was going to have to put it over the sticker. And generally speaking, what you don't want to do when you're is that Wawa around here? Uh, when you're putting Velcro on a pedal, is put it anywhere where it's over the sticker. So if you happen to pull the Velcro off, it pulls the sticker off. So I was like, you know, I know what I can do. I can take this bit of business and I can split it down the middle and I can come up with two strips like this and I'll be able to get lots of surface area to adhere the pedal to the board. 
but at the same time, I'm not going to rip off the label when you get to the bottom there. And, you know, we don't think about these things, you know, now, but 20 years from now, 30 years from now, as, you know, some of the pedals that are made today all of a sudden become hyper valuable, kind of like the Klon and so on and so forth. You kind of go, okay, you know what? I probably shouldn't have stuck that Velcro on the bottom. Uh, so there that is. So, oh, okay. So Chris Alexander, I, you know, do you know how much in a male bonding way I adore you? Just, just, just know that. Um, Chris is the informal head of the Doug Doppler fan club. I, I haven't told him that, but uh, he is, so just know that. Um, so here's the thing, is that uh, it's a funny thing that you mentioned about this because, boy, here we go. Um, so the side of this pedal, uh, I went to clean it up. And this side had, and one of the ways you can tell stuff that you do and do not want to take an abrasive, I wouldn't call this a surface, an, an abrasive cleaner to that has texture, is if it feels like something has kind of cut under the surface, that's probably not when you want to start, want to be rubbing that off. But this little pedal's got, and you can tell by just kind of rubbing your nail against it, that's smut. Uh, and so I can tell that that's the sort of thing that I probably want to, dare I say, lick that puppy and then kind of start to rub it off because I'll be able to get that nice and clean. I've been, uh, you know, I've, I'm, I'm getting ready to do a, a video. I'm going to catch up on all of this in just a moment. Look at all this chat. I love this. I obviously, uh, people are interested in, in, in pedals and boards. Um, at least they seem to be. So, uh, So the funny thing... Ah, oh, come on. Trying this thing. Maybe I'll have better luck with a pick. I'm going to tell a nostalgia story here in a moment. say about that sorry uh my buddy cc kind of drew me in the, with the bay with that so one of my early lessons with joe satriani um he actually had me play uh, the, uh that song uh, by bookie booker t and the mg so uh kind of cool so uh that was uh, of course uh you know something that was you know there, there's a, a song on the album where we kind of revisited that basic vibe so in any case i digress all right, hook and loops. Thank you very much. She's a smart lady. So, so, so here's the thing that what you want to be conscious of with some of these surfaces, uh, and I've had a, a problem. So the reason I mentioned the paper towels is that upstairs uh, that I'm getting ready to sell is my old controller from Rocktron. And at one point there was some schfutz on the readout. So I was like, I kind of wet the paper towel and that particular surface, I ended up scratching it with the paper towel. So if it's a metal surface and it appears that it's on the top of it, paper towel's great. Uh, if it's something that I'm worried about scratching, I'll use this or some sort of, if I've got an eyeglass, uh, a, a glasses cleaner that you would use to clean your glasses. Is there one in here? There we go. These are great because if you can use them as something as gentle as your glasses, they're great for pedal boards and they're really neat because they kind of collect the dust and clean the schwutz at the same time. Um, the thing about some of the alcohol stuff is I'm, I'm conscious that sometimes uh, that can discolor some things that are made out of plastic. So uh, I'm a little cautious about that. If it's metal, no problem. But some of the pedals these days, well, for example, this guy, uh, this casing is plastic. It's one of the ways that they make it. You know, it's like a hundred bucks or something. Uh, so the point being is, I would be very cautious 
about using any type of alcohol on here, potentially discolored. And by the way, if you wanted to test it, test it on the bottom of the pedal. All right, power. Generally speaking, the majority of your pedals on your pedal board are gonna to wanna to run at nine volts. Generally speaking, you do not want to run more volts into your pedal than it's asking for. There are some pedals like the OCD that can take 18 volts and it will bump up the headroom of the pedal. Uh, and so it'll, it means the pedal will behave a little bit differently. Uh, but the vast majority of the pedals that you can run only want to see nine volts. Now, what about milliamps? I thought you were gonna ask that. So the deal is there are some pieces of gear like the uh, the, the stuff from Strymon, very hungry for milliamps. So that's where you wanna be conscious and maybe grab a piece of paper and go ahead and go through the manuals and see how many, good, still sticking, how many milliamps things draw. And basically, um, this particular guy draws one amp, and I re and you know I've gotten in the habit of reading manuals, uh, and the manual on this guy says, hey, you know, it, in, in the most second uh, aftermarket power supplies may have a problem here because one one uh, excuse me one amp rather not one milliamp it's a one amp draw as I recall, that's a fairly big draw, um, but the thing is is that if you've got a really good power supply, I'm a big fan of the True Tone stuff. Um, so it means that you have to add up all the draws of all your pedals and then take a look at how much power your pedal board power supply can handle as it maxes out and then make sure that you're under that. The other thing is that you can use, of course, more than one pedal board power supply. Uh, but I generally, you know, like the bit, the larger True Tone, I think it's the CS12. I think it's great. And I love that. Um, so let me just poke my eyes in here and make sure if there, and if I miss anything, uh, you know, he, he ask again, because every so often I miss something, it means that I'm not ignoring you. Um, so especially like Chris, Chris Columbo, uh, just a uh, Booker T, what was the name of that song? Um, <laughs> green on you. There we go. Thank you. All right. Uh, so. Uh, Chris definitely deserves that title. All right. Uh, East Coast Fan Club Manager. I don't know what inspires me to do uh, <laughs> this stuff. Roger, hey, come on, everybody. Let's wish Roger a happy birthday. Happy. In a not good way. Boy, what a great ear training exercise. You know what? I am going to come back to that a little bit later uh, because one of the things I know about Happy Birthday is it doesn't start on the tonic. Tonic. Starts on the five. We'll come back to that. Note to self, happy birthday. In any case, Roger celebrated a birthday. Happy birthday, my man. Great to see you. <laughs> All right. Uh, we'll do uh, Noah. Okay. Uh, oh, awesome. Chad, thank you much. We appreciate it. I'm, Steve Cropper would be proud. No, he wouldn't the way I just killed this song. But uh, in any case, uh, okay, Chris, you are the best. It's Sean Varley, hello, hello, hello. Uh, getting coffee, I, I feel you. I probably don't need any more, but you know what? Let's make sure the tank doesn't get empty. Mm. Okay. Uh, oh, my word. Oh. Awesome, awesome, awesome. There should be another Vi Academy. He generally does it every other year, um, uh, depending on what happens. Sometimes every year it depends. But I look forward to seeing you uh, in person again. Awesome, awesome, Noah. Hey, Eric, what's going on? Keep smiling, pedals are our uh, color, period. I love that. Enough said. I absolutely, um, I could talk about this all day. Focus Fox is out. Okay, 
Uh, first of all, Michael, hey, what's going on? I, oh, all right, hold on. Very clearly, people seem to love the pedal thing. So hang on a second. I love pedals. I just don't use many, though. Auto uh, return wash, super uh, fat mod, uh, and, uh, and canyons are a lot of fun. Oh, awesome, but mostly just plug into my Spark Mini. Great little amps. Uh, okay, so what do I think about the Vertex line? That is a great question. Hang on a second. So at one point, I will post uh, some photos of the pedal wall, but uh, if you would ask me what I think of the Vertex line, I'd say, uh, well, I think they're great. <laughs> I have a few. So uh, in, this, in the San Francisco Bay Area here, there's uh, a guy named Mason Marangella. Really, really good friend. I've known him for a long time. You guys can stay over here. Um, and so we do this Friday. I don't go, but maybe once a month. Uh, breakfast where all these pedal fanatics get together. And guess what we talk about here? All right, Focus Flux. I, I want to jump back into the chat, but as you discovered, I get a little excited when I do. All right. Usa. All right, so talking about the Velcro thing, again, if you've got a pedal like this and you don't want to take the, the label off the bottom, just kind of find your way to cut strips if you can to make it such that you can cover the bottom of the pedal with as much surface area as reasonable, uh, but without kind of disturbing that label there. They'll, I'm going to be making... Uh, some content sooner than later about all of that stuff. This Leslie pedal, like a number of the pedals that are out these days, uh, going off screen again. Maddie, where are you, buddy? Uh, Maddie's pedal is over here. I actually have two of them. So Maddie, John Petrucci's tech, is a friend of mine. There we go. So tech work. Instruments, he's got a TRS splitter. And what's kind of groovy about this guy is, as you might imagine, it takes a TRS cable. Sorry. TRS cable, that's the input jack, and splits it into two TSs. And if you don't know what that is, now I actually know I can find the appropriate box. Boy, I've completely lost the plot today, and I'm loving every second of it. Every second of it. So I've got a box with a bunch of cables that are only TRS cables. And so the neat thing about all of this is that enables me to go to this box and kind of show you guys, there we go, what a TRS and a TS actually looks like. So, you know, because this is one of the a video that needs to be and will be made sooner than later. So the label maniac is here. There we go. All right. So the deal is there are a number of different types of situations that we find ourselves in. Uh, this little guy right here is kind of the classic example of a TRS tip ring sleeve. Let's see if we can do that slightly in focus. Uh, let's put it up against something black and see how that works. No. Okay. So basically, uh, there's the tip and then there's a little baby black little area that makes it so the tip is separated from the ring and then in turn the sleeve and in turn this terminates out you could arguably call this a stereo cable and then that in turn terminates out this one cable into two mono cables or that are just tip sleeve and so traditionally you would use that on a pedal like this if you're going to run it in stereo which is the way it's designed to be you would put the ts trs cable into the output and then in turn you would separate these guys, hang on, let me make sure the output is, no, no, my bad. So this actually has a T at, Velcro still held. All right, so it has stereo outputs, but it's got a mono or stereo input. And this is one of the things, if you've never dealt with the cables like this before, you'd be like, I don't understand. Uh, because until I, you know, kind of wrap my head around all this, I was like, well, wait a second, there's just one input. How do I run stereo into it? And it's because it wants to see a TRS cable, which basically is a stereo cable. It allows you to run left and right going into a pedal like this. Now, as it turns out, my signal chain up until this pedal is going to be mono. But at this point, I will potentially be running this guy in stereo in some situations. So one of the cool things about Maddie's box, it allows you to take a TS, sorry, a TRS, it's easy for you to say, a TRS cable, and then without having to use a cable like this, you can then break it out into two individual 
TS cables, and that's advantage. And that's um, one of the places you could use that um, would be, for example, the Petrucci guitar. So that um, you know, it's got a, a piezo uh, and a traditional magnetic output, and it comes out if you want to out of one TRS cable. In turn, you can run that down to this box, and then in turn split that out here, uh, because if you want to have a long guitar cable. Um, you you don't have an awful lot of options in terms of one that goes from tip ring sleeve TRS to TS. Now, when I did the video for the Petrucci Majesty guitar, I actually had Mogami Custom make a cable for me. This is long 18-foot cable that is TRS on one end and fans out to the TS, to dual TSs on the other end. But, you know, it would, it would cost a bazillion dollars to have that cable made kind of aftermarket, and it was just because I was doing that video that they did that. Point being, cables matter. All right, last thing on the pedal board front before I, I make sure that, uh, uh, hey, I love that. Uh, <laughs> you know, the funny thing is, is that I think you can see my favorite stand right back here, Eric. Congratulations. There it is. The great thing about this stand is you can take it anywhere. And I love that. Uh, so generally, I just kind of take my guitar and kind of go, all right, there you go, boom. Uh, and it's flipping great. Brooks, good morning to you, my friend. Uh, Michael, I'm in, I'm in Maryland. Hello, 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 hello. Maryland, all right, awesome. Okay, Roger, uh, with great pleasure. <laughs> my, my terrible version of happy birthday. If that made your day, it made mine too. So we're even. Um, I want to talk, the last thing I want to talk about, uh, again, uh, the, the, the revisiting the power part of this thing, you want to be aware of how many milliamps. Your average stomp boxes don't draw that much power. But when you start dealing with stuff like Strymon, they have a high milliamp draw. And as I said, I think this guy actually draws one amp. Uh, the Line 6 stuff will frequently draw multiple amps. So you want to be conscious of that. The other thing about some of the Line 6 gear, it actually has uh, what they call reverse polarity. So you also sometimes have to use an adapter on some of the pedals. Uh, and so just be conscious of the power thing. Generally speaking, don't run a 9-volt power uh, pedal on an 18-volt power supply. We'll give you some problems. Now that gets us to... A, B boxes. I'm going to go down the rabbit trail for but a moment, and then we're going to jump on to the next subject. Um, I am a lover of blending multiple amps together, uh, and there's some nuances that happen when you begin to do that. The most common one that you will get is ground loop noise. Um, Uh, this is a box from my buddy Daniel over at the Gig Rig uh, that, again, there are different ways when you can begin to combine multiple devices together that if you don't have some ways to deal with ground loops that can happen from different power supplies and different power sources, uh, you're going to run yourself into a problem. So this guy from Radio, I absolutely love this box. It's got more switches and and buttons and things you can do with this uh, to control it. There are, uh, and I, this has been my go-to AB box for quite some time. Uh, basically, it enables you to, to do you know A or B or both, and it also has a boost control. Uh, it also has what radio calls a drag. So basically, it imitates, because by the time you run one cable into here and then a cable into each of the different amps, you've added a bunch of cable there. So there's a drag control that attempts to make it so you can manipulate the way the pedal loads your pickups such that it's most like when you just plug the guitar straight into the amp, the way that guitar behaves because there's an, an impedance that happens and the more cable you put in between you and the amplifier, the more in general the top end starts to drop off. Now there is a nuance to this, is that generally speaking, I've never had any sound man go, hey, can you turn up the treble? But there's also some dynamics that, that can get lost depending, and things can get murky. Murky is never a sound that we want to have associated with us. So on this guy, there are a couple of really important buttons on here. 
phase and then a, basically a ground lift. And so the short version of it is, is that if one speaker, uh, one speaker is because of the amplifier, I, no, let me not say the speaker, that's wrong, that's incorrect, strike that. Basically what's happening is, is that there is a, when you draw a sound wave, it goes up and it goes down and it keeps fluctuating up and down. And if two amplifiers from two different manufacturers are not headed in the same direction when you put a note through them, the sound will cancel itself out or to some extent, depending on how alike or dissimilar those two amplifiers are. So if you don't have the ability to invert the phase of one of those amplifiers, you've got a problem when you start to use two amps together, potentially. The other thing is the ground lift being able to isolate one of those amplifiers so you don't get a ground loop is a very important thing. So generally speaking, if you're going to buy an AB box, you want both of those features there. Now, truth be told, as much as I have absolutely loved this box, the one thing that I don't like about it is it requires, wait for it, 15 volts. Now, of all my power supplies that are out there, none of them supply 15 volts. So I got to reach out to my friends in radio and ask them kind of what, what their solution for pedal board power is on this. Um, but my guess is you can't run this off of a, a traditional pedal board power supply. Uh, of the new radial design, you're seeing more of them be nine volt. I actually had this conversation with them at the NAMM show. So that again gets us to kind of one of the other things you want to be conscious of is what are the power requirements? This is also another pedal that I would be inclined to. It's got these little kind of, I'm just gonna say nipply feet, uh, cause that's what came to mind. So they're kind of these nipply feet and I would be inclined to pull them off all together and then put the Velcro on the bottom of the pedal. Again, I try not to cover up any stickers. Did I say nipply feet? I sure did. All right, that gets us to, so I must admit, I become a total Mesa Boogie fanboy. Uh, I'm I'm an endorser of Mesa Boogie. I'm an endorser of of Gibson as well, and I'm in the process of of gathering as many of the toys. Uh, some of which they send me from time to time, and some of which I buy. I bought these guys uh, such that I can kind of you know be be on the team. Uh, and this is their switch track, and this has got a ton of great features. It will run on nine volt power. Uh, it's got the ability to uh, uh, lift ground. Uh, 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 I should say isolate the ground slash lift it. It's got phase um, reversal for one of the amplifiers. It's also got MIDI in and out. And that is a big, big, big deal in my world because sooner than later, I'm going to have all this crazy stuff that you see here wired together in different variations of large rigs that allow me to toggle between different amps. Hence the whole concept of the switch track so I can switch between the amps. The other thing about this is first of all, these switches... They're, I think these are called, I don't remember the name of when you kind of hear the clicky. Let's just call them, these don't click, they just kind of depress. So they're more of a relay style, I guess. I should learn that. I will. Um, but the point being is, is that you can kind of, you know, quite often with, with a switch like this, you can kind of have your foot on it. And then when you let go of it, it switches. So you can kind of be over by your pedal board. And every so often when you use a foot switch, uh, there'll be a little bit of delay in between when it switches between two things. So sometimes just being able to have your foot there and just going, letting go of it will be a help in terms of how that works. So again, the fact that that's nine volts, it's got MIDI so I can put it in the framework of a larger rig and use some sort of MIDI controller or MIDI looper uh, and it's going to be in right now. It's going to be the PBC six X. Uh, the good folks at RJM, uh, I did the, I did the launch for that. But they've also made one for Fender that I'm excited to check out as well. So that's supposed to be on its way to me. All right, gosh darn it. Uh, oh, awesome. Okay. Uh, all right. Caffeine is the best. <laughs> Uh, all right, good, 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 good. All right, all right, all right. Email sent, good, 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 good. I'm just kind of going through here. Rick Harrison, speaking of another happy birthday, let's see if I can I can do a little bit better job this time. 
Rick celebrated his 21st birthday again. Uh, happy birthday. That was uh, last, the week that passed. But let's see if we can get over here. There we go. All right, I, should, I need to have one. All right, so let's let's ear train. Uh, happy birthday for a moment. We're gonna take a little little jog at the. Before we go over into A Mixolydian land, we're gonna go into A major line. So the interesting thing about Happy Birthday, uh, by the way, Rick. All right, so what's happening here? If we were to take the A major scale. There's our one seven six five 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 six five one seven five five six five two one five 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 up an octave four so five three two five three one seven six all right so I should have been able to that's just a major triad going backwards and if it's forwards is one three five I guess backwards it'd be five one three. Sorry, five, three, one, seven, six, four, four, three, one, two, one. So the ability to scale sing the major scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, five, five, six, five, one, seven, five, five, six, five, two, one, five, 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 three, one, seven, six. Four, four, three, one, two, one. Gives you a way to kind of make sense of that. Does that make sense of that? All right. In any case, uh, happy birthday, Rick. Uh, awesome, awesome, awesome. Eric Martin Bureau. Hey, my man. <laughs> Mike Rand, always a pleasure. PBC6X is awesome. That's right. All right. Excellent. Excellent. 71. Not looking a day over 51 at that. All right. Brett, what's going on? You can power the radio with 18 volt. It has internal voltage regulation. Thank you very much. Good to know. So then that gets us to, uh, thank you. I appreciate that, Brett. Gets us to, well, you know, which power supplies do and do not have 18 volts and making sure that you can or can't power the pedals that you want. Thank you for that, Brett. Much, much appreciated. And my friends at radio will appreciate that as well. All right. Gosh darn it. Uh, uh, I made a rendition of uh, Happy Birthday and played it in E major. Love those open chords. Uh, you can use really utilize the whole fretboard and give you uh, gnarly sustain. All right, I can't resist. All right, so, um, oh. Ah, yes, okay. So, let's see how I do. Uh, I'm gonna take, before we focus on Mixolydian, I'm gonna take uh, Happy Birthday, and let's see how, if I can play it through all seven modes. So we're gonna start off with major. <laughs> Major Dorian. Yeah, okay, so Dorian. Oh 
Oh boy, Phrygian. <laughs> Essentially, uh, Shane, what's going on, my man? <laughs> uh, I love the idea of uh, what Joe Satriani called the pitch axis. And, the, you know, for example, if you took the major scale at A, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, A, you can say that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one. Dorian is one, two, flat three, four, five, six, flat seven, one. Phrygian flat two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, one. Lydian two, three, sharp four, five, six, seven, one. Mixed Lydian two, three, four, five, six, flat seven, one. Minor two, flat three, four, five, flat six, flat seven, one. Low green flat two, flat three, four, flat five, flat six, flat seven, one. So the interesting thing about this happy birthday business, unlike a lot of melodies, because it's starting from the five, it's already starting a little upside down which is why it's so great to do something like this with so essentially you have to track all right what type of five and six do you have and immediately goes to the one and the seven so let me just do that for uh for all seven modes there just so we can hear what that little piece sounds like just as a sake of demonstrating because there's enough meat on those modes again that's the five six one and the seven so for major for dorian for phrygian for Lydian, for Mixolydian, minor, Locrian. So you begin to kind of hear how the modes begin to flavor a melody in a really neat way. Uh, one of the things we're going to do on the lesson front um, sooner than later, uh, this week we're going to be focusing on... Mixolydian, as promised to my buddy Jim, and kind of the continuation on of taking a look at how we can easily create modes. One of the things that um, that I think really gives people a hard time is to go, okay, well, I know how to play this fingering of fill-in-the-blank mode, but it feels, one, like I'm running scales. Two, I don't know how to create a melody with it. And three, if I wanted to create a chord progression using it, I don't even know where to start. Um, and so the idea is there are certain exclusive relationships that occur if in this case you took the G major scale, G, A, B, C, D, E, F sharp, G, the order of the chords if you took the first, third, and fifth note for the mode started off of each of its seven successive tones, that order goes major, minor, minor, major, major, minor, diminished, major. And this little graphic right here does a really great job of showing you how those chord shapes come right out of those modes. Um, and that's why I like the second finger root modes. Uh, when I started studying with Joe Satriani, those were the first sets of modes that he showed me. I don't know for a fact if he ever wrote out all of the three note per string modes. We obviously talked about them, we obviously used them. They obviously became a big part of that. Uh, that bit of business. But, um, you know, the reason the second finger root modes are so important, again, is the relationship between chords and scales is something that if we really can kind of, if you will, quote unquote, see that, literally, uh, it makes life a lot easier. And so there, actually, let me bring that back real quick. So if you take a look at 
the the Dorian and Phrygian finger, you're going to see that the only ones that are kind of, if you think about, ma and it says G major, A Dorian, B Phrygian, C Lydian, D Mixolydian, D minor, F sharp, Locrian, and G major, the A Dorian and B Phrygian are the only two modes that are next door to each other and have both have minor chords. So the short way of, my, I put that is they're, they're basically two minor chords a whole step apart. It only occurs at the one, two, and three. That is say the two and the three. This is one, two, three, the two and the three. At the three and the four, it's the only spot where we got a minor chord or a major chord a half step above it. And the four and the five, it's the only spot where we got uh, two, mi uh, two major chords a whole step apart. That is to say, if we got two minor chords, it's in Dorian. Minor chord with a major chord a half step above it. That's the three and the four. Instant Phrygian. If I put A in the bass and I play an A major chord, and I go to a B major chord, I've created Instant Lydian. And what's neat about it, again, once you have the chords going... is instantly set. We're going to take that same approach, but instead of going four chord to five chord, we're going to go four chord to five chord. And we're again leveraging these exclusive relationships that occur between the two and the three, three and the four, and the four and the five. And by putting the bass note of the five in the bass, and putting the four a whole step below it, Instant mixolydian. So let's talk a little bit about the mixolydian because uh, you know because we've continued on in this thread of like all right this is how we this is how we bake modes. I want to talk about a couple of other approaches for this uh, because this is going to be the last of these kind of the deal with the exclusive relationship. Obviously anything involving that diminished chord up there at the seven instant locrian, but that kind of is so obvious that we don't need to go there for the mixolydian thing. I could find other ways of doing this. So one. Um, Two, I will create this chord progression and throw it down. Uh, um, what am I going to do? This is how I'm going to do it. So I'm going to go four chord over the five in the bass. And that way you really get the sense of like this chord really wants to resolve to there. And it's a great way to set up A mix linear in this case. You can do the same thing for E. doing is basically this guy right here is a a D major triad that's an E major triad in the first inversion that's going three five one that's our D that's our E that's right here is a you might know that D shape that's it a, a D major triad slightly out of tune in second inversion that's going five one three over E D over E and then E so that there was first inversion, second inversion, and uninverted. That's actually kind of a pretty movement. In any case, those are kind of three ways of playing the same thing. What's valuable about that is that gives you three different voicings you could potentially use on the fourth, third, and second strings. So, for example, if I wanted to play it over the open E string, that's a four chord to a five chord movement in first inversion with the root on the second string. Second inversion with the root on the second, no, no, the root on the, on the, on the, the third string, so sorry. And then root voicing with the root on the fourth string. Now, wh why is this valuable? Because I can take this relationship of it being on the fourth string and go, hey, let me drop it down here. And I can 
can go, okay, well, that's root forcing. Then I guess the next one up here is going to be. And I can go, well, wait a second. If I can do that down there and I'm at A, can I go like a G? And now we've employed that. Now, why would we want to know how to do that? Because there are times that we want the sound, if you will. On the neck. Uh, for one thing, when you're playing down there, if I'm in this case in the key of A mixolydian, natural seven wasn't in there, but I like to create a little bit of tension there. So the point being is if I were playing a melody or soloing over this, keeping these chords out of the path of the melody or the solo, keeping them lower on the neck, generally we don't spend a huge amount of time soloing that area, so we're kind of getting them out of the way of the other chords. Does that make sense? Um, and so having the ability to kind of do that, let's say again we move back to the key of E, well again, I can then kind of use this first inversion, D major, the roots there on the second string, to E, D over E, and E, where before I used G over A, roots on the fourth string, and just allows me to kind of be in this area of the neck, which creates some space for the rest of the neck to not be in the way of what's going on. And that uh, is, is important. One of the things that I didn't get a chance to uh, do today that we will be doing uh, again, I'm going to be out of town this next week. I get to go see uh, Mr. Satriani and Mr. Vi in New York City uh, next Saturday night. I'm pretty much besides myself. Um, so in any case, not going to be here next Saturday. I will be here the following week. Uh, as I hinted at a, a minute ago, one of the other things we're going to begin to do is look at how we can create... mode change and progressions. And, and one of the things, that, you know, now that we've conquered how to easily build modal chord progressions, and so you can use these same tools, that is to say, you could go for this progression again, G, and this is just of using the third finger at the fifth fret on the fourth string, second finger at the fourth fret on the third string, and the first finger at the third fret on the second string. That's just our major triad shape. We're just sliding it up a whole step. So the root there is on the fourth string at G, G to A. If you want to get fancy, Basically what I'm doing is I'm playing a D major there. And just playing that triad there. So that is in second inversion. I'm basically going five, one, three. So I'm so on and so forth. And that makes it really easy to just kind of begin to get the sounds of the modes up and running. Uh, and you could take those chords and then just change the rhythm. And I encourage you to take those chords and change the rhythm and steal them. Uh, uh, let's say you wanted to do a ska version. You know, or kind of a, you know, kind of a, I don't know, a slightly metally, not the mixolydian's class. I, And so on and so forth. Now, I mentioned another way to kind of come up with mixing. So before I uh, talk about this mode changing thing, one of the other things you could do. Then you're kind of using 
the sound of the mixolydian mode. Now, as it turns out, mixolydian is the only mode that has a natural three and a flat seven. That is, if I were to take the A major scale, A, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G sharp, and A, instead of hitting a G sharp, I hit a G, a, B, C sharp, D, E, F sharp, G, A. That's a mixolydian mode. And compared to the major scale, instead of going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, it's going 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, flat 7, 1. 7, 1, flat 7, 1. Uh, classical ear training, because we talked about that um, 1, 1. So the interesting thing is because we were in A major, when I went to sing Happy Birthday, I immediately actually modulated actually up to D because I started off that root note. But if I were to be in one, three, five, 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 one, five, two, one, five, five, six, five, one, seven, I'd, I'd be in A, which is where I should have gone. But I kind of went there. And this is one of the dangers about melodies that don't start at the one is we have a tendency we were cruising along in a major although we were technically in a mixolydian kind of where we started but if we were just kind of listening to a major if we were going to do happy birthday we got to know to go up to the one two three four five happy birthday five five six five one seven so on and so forth so you just got to watch out for melodies that don't start on the one because they can be a little challenging. Getting back to one, one, seven, quite often the way you find out what type of something seven something's got, one, one, you jump up the octave and you either go down a half step to a natural seven or if you can hear, na, na, and if you can take da, 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 and subdivide that in a half of da, 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 da. Then you know it's a flat seven because the, from the one backwards and sevens they half step, and from the one to the flat seven is a whole step. So, in any case, the interesting thing about the mixolydian mode in any of these, and I'm going to disagree, and we're getting close to time here. No, we're over time, but so we're getting close to my uh, moving onward in my day. But I want to make sure I complete this idea. Uh, the mixolydian mode in any of the modes, if you can identify where the tritone is in the mode, that is to say this little bit of weirdness, uh, that's going to make it so you can instantly identify the sound and the voicing. Mr. Beato talks about five, if you know where the half steps are, it allows you to identify you know, what mode it is. And that's absolutely true because there's no two spots in the major scale you can find that we'll have an identical order of whole steps and half steps. So since there's more whole steps than half steps, if you know where the two sets of half steps are, that does, it does allow you to identify that. But that is, a, in my opinion, a much longer path than going, hey, where is this tritone? As it works out in the major scale, I'm going to use the key of G major. It's between the natural four and the natural seven. As you move up to Dorian, it's between the flat three and the natural six. As you move up to Phrygian, it's between the flat two and the five. As you move up to Lydian, it's between the one and the sharp four. As you move up to Mixolydian, it's between the, I'm flipping it around now, it's the three and the flat seven. So the only mode that has a natural three and a flat seven is Mixolydian. So if you basically, if I can play some little riff that's got a, let's just say I'm gonna just pedal, I'm gonna pedal A, I'm going to just kind of go the flat seven, which is G, and I'm going to hit the, uh, the C sharp, which is the natural three. And now I'm just adding the other notes to it. Um, it's the easiest, most simplistic way you can create the mode as a bass line, which is insanely cool. What I love about this is that it's not complicated. And the frustrating part for me as a teacher, because I just want people to, to know how to use the tools of music and have fun doing so without getting frustrated. It's quite often taught in a way that's really hard to wrap your head around. I spend a lot of time watching different music educators on YouTube explain things, some explaining them well and some not so well. Um, and so the ability is kind of go, hey, look, if you want to create mixolydian, 
four chord and five chord, four over the five chord space note, you're there. And if you want to do it around a bass line, if you can take the natural three and the flat seven, and here I just moved it down an octave, that's G, take my word for it, and so is that. And then you can just kind of hear, I wanted to go to the C sharp to the A. not to destroy green onions this time. All right, let me just check in on the chat here before I jet out of here. But great to see so many friendly, familiar faces. You know, I've said it before and I will definitely say it again. There is nothing I would rather do on a Saturday morning than hang out with you and talk about pedals and power and Velcro and and Mixolydian and, and all of this stuff. Uh, uh, and Stefano Mojo. Uh, so much appreciated. Jim, dominant seven arpeggios. Give me a quick example of Mixolydian improvisation. So ironically, I haven't actually played the five there, but any mode that has a natural three, has a natural five. So I don't actually have to play the five. So in a sense, um, that is a an A dominant seven arpeggio. But I can go. Now let's have a little bit of fun with this. Uh, uh, so A dominant seven is basically A, C sharp, and E and G. Mercy. C natural instead of a C sharp. So let's leave with this thought. Jim, with pleasure. Uh, come on. Oh, no. Come monsters. Oh, come on. I love that. That's so clever. I love that. Come monsters. That, that appeals to me. So to answer your question, and I'm going to jump back to Jim here. I love the DiMarzio 36th, I don't know why they did the 36th anniversary PAF, I love that. It's not super high output. Uh, in this is the Sustaniac narrow aperture humbucking neck pickup. I love that. Um, but my favorite neck pickup ever is the PAF Joe from DiMarzio. It is the best sounding neck and I'll come back to this Mixolydian thing here, but let me demonstrate the PAF Joe with another flying V. How about that? Put my money where my mouth is. Come on. Um, now, I will. This is where I kind of have to put up the the you know the advisory. I am a Demarzio endorser, so I am I am biased. But you know, I've played lots of different pickups, um, and my favorite pickups in the world are the Demarzios and. You know, I have some old Les Pauls. I have some original PAFs, uh, and they sound great. I love them, but you know, it, you know, I'm not going to go out and drop ten grand on another pair of PAFs anytime soon. Um, and the PAFs that I, I've got came in guitars. But um, the thing about the PAF Joe, uh, it's got. <laughs> 
Now this particular setting I'm on does not have a ton of gain, so let's uh. <laughs> So the thing I love about, here's the bridge. Um, so there is a little mixolydian there. That's the uh, the 36th anniversary PAF. And that is everything that I love about the PAF, Joe. It's... Um, it's... It's got spank. Um, it doesn't uh, get muddy. really touch sensitive. It's also got a little bit of strattiness to it. I'm pretty sure I'll be out of tune. Yeah, I am. I, I have, I kind of knew that going into this. Hang on a second. Uh, I'll play a couple of stratoid things. Uh, obviously, it was attempting to go into Wind Cries Mary, but not out of tune. Uh, there we go. A little bit better. There we go. By the way, one of these shows sooner than later, I'm going to do something on on string prep uh, and changing strings and all of that because it's important. Here's the bridge pickup. I've changed uh, to a different sound. Now this is not the super meatiest, biggest, giantest sound, but I've been using it, and this is kind of what we'll talk about in one of the subsequent hangs that we're going to do is uh, is some recording stuff. <laughs> And talking about double tracking, just learning to kind of get stuff under me muscle memory. And then be able to play it a second time. And just lay one down and lay another one down and kind of my tips on where to pan and all of that stuff. So we'll be covering that. But the point being is this is the, the sound that... The double track sounds really nice and meaty, but it is not the world's biggest sound. But I kind of left it up this morning because I'm like, let me make myself work a little bit, right? The other thing is, is that in theory, with any sound, you should be able to... To answer your question, PAF Judge.
And it's nice to kind of have a tone from time to time that you make yourself work on. I like that. I like work. Work is good. Um, uh, hang on a second. All right. Uh, all right. Hang on a second. Uh, let me just get caught up here. Chris, I think those pickups sound great. I just love them. And, you know, what's neat about them, and this is kind of one of the other things that, um, and, and thank, again, I love that. Come on, Sturs, it's crafty. Uh, Jim, with pleasure. I got my, uh, there we go. Oh, come on. Happy Easter to you as well. Uh, so let me, in a moment, I'm going to go back to the dominance. And we're running a little bit over, but you know what? I'm happy to do that. Uh, awesome, 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 awesome. Dude, I just love them. So any of the Vs that I just kind of keep with a stock configuration, as well as the um, the SG that I've got over there, I just basically, if it's a Gibson and it's got a pair of humbuckers, I just drop them in there. I've just had great luck. They do all the things that I, I want and need out of a guitar. They have enough gain, so you, you know, when you want, you know, uh, the rhythm. <laughs> Especially if you need a little bit more than that, you know. But they also... Very touch sensitive again. And more importantly, this is part of what I started to allude to a moment ago. I like gear that it sounds like the piece of gear, but it doesn't prevent whatever other pieces of gear it's working with from sounding like themselves. That is to say, those pickups make this guitar and all the different guitars, they have an inherent sound that they bring. Very clearly so, especially the PAF Joe. Uh, in many ways, the, 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 the 36th anniversary PAF in the bridge is intended to be a low output humbucker, or it's probably tomorrow's, you would probably call it a medium output. But the idea is it's not intended to drive the front end of the amp super hard. So it means you get more of the character of the guitar. So in a, in a sense, this is kind of one of the, of all the different, I used to use the Tone Zone as my main bridge pickup. Has a lot of extra push in the front end. So it's got a lot of character. This, this pickup, uh, although it has a lot of character, it doesn't add a lot of extra, extra color to your sound. I'm gonna add a little bit of uh, a little bit of fun stuff here and and the thing about delay and reverb, which is what I added there in on uh, the application from Universal Audio. Uh, that kind of goes with uh, the Apollo audio interfaces that I use. Uh, it's It just adds that ambience that when you've got a really nice, clear... Brian Felix, what's going on, my man? Sonia, hello, great to see you. Hello, hello, hello. Could I play this week's track? So I've got to, I've still got to put it together, but it's... Or something. And thank you, Richard, appreciate that. Many thanks, my friend. Uh, like the photo there, hello, hello, hello. Okay, uh, Sonia, pleasure. I'm Sooner than later, you're going to see the... Uh, the, uh, the, the controller mouse showing up. Okay, those pickups back off beautifully, but yet have enough growl to, to, to spice things. That's kind of the whole point, right? Um, what's going on, Braden? AKA Brad. Happy Easter, my friend. So the thing about, you know, the, the what I'm looking for in, in gear, and again, it's a personal thing. I want to add color, but not so much color that the one... It's like if you put too much salt in a recipe, you're like, all you taste is the salt. You want enough color so that it adds to the flavor without uh, doing damage to the overall palate. And the thing about, I'm finding that I'm spending a lot of time, well, I'm gonna unpack this uh, and then I'm out of here at half past. Uh, one of the things that I didn't have time in prep to go over it, that we're gonna talk about 
in two weeks because next week I'm going to be at my Satriani in New York watching those guys blow my mind, uh, which is, I can't wait. By the way, if you haven't seen the new video for uh, Sea of Emotion Part 1, just go see it. It's awesome. Awesome. So I've been spending a lot of time preparing for this album, the instrumental and vocal album. They may come out as a double album. They may come out as individual albums, but I've been spending a lot of time in pre-production really working on my rhythm guitar parts and a big part of great rhythm guitar work as as I define it for myself is I don't want a bunch of gain uh, to get in the way of what it is that I'm trying to do. So having a sound that's relevant, and this guitar is, a, is actually markedly brighter than that one. <laughs> enough personality that when you start double tracking the parts they they the sum of the parts really bring something out that on its own and I've got it written down John Cunaberti had and I had a long conversation as I kind of went into this phase of the recording project and he was like it sometimes the right part isn't always the best sounding all on its own <laughs> When you start putting one on the left and one on the right, so you can clear up that lane in the middle, the slightly sparseness of it, especially when you double it, allows it to just kind of create this little ear candy on the outside. It's such that when it, what's in the center can sound a little bit more special than that which is around it. It's kind of like if you made the analogy of a sandwich, you're trying to create the right bread for the main event. Like if you think about it, if you like roast beef, you can eat roast beef without a sandwich. But a sandwich without the roast beef doesn't taste like a roast beef sandwich. Um, the point being, this kind of psychology around this, and I've spent so much time recording and using gear and trying to craft tones. I'm, I am, I'm kind of at the last laps of this recording process, both with the vocal side and the instrumental side, and you know some of this stuff. Uh, hmm. Are songs that I've massaged over and over and over, recorded a number of times, not in the process of, you know, kind of not knowing what I'm doing, but the idea of just kind of coming up with. Uh <laughs> If you record something enough times, you 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 are able to benefit yourself. Uh, and I didn't forget about the dominant seven arpeggios that are coming. Um, and it's what we're going to close out with. Uh, you're able to afford yourself the ability to kind of know um, what the part. So that's one of the two main rhythm guitar settings. That one is at the 25 watt mode. This is at the 45 watt mode. And I'm in the number two pickup selection. For that particular sound, and I'm a little hot on the mic here, because uh, I got a shotgun mic, but I'm not going to adjust the level. So 
know, having a sound that you have spent a bunch of time recording over and over and building into muscle memory is a big deal. All right, dominant seven arpeggios. Gosh darn, I'm going to add a little bit of a little bit of the love factor here. Um, so, Jim, I asked, do you tap? Uh, I want to know. I want to know. <laughs> And, uh, uh, thanks, Chris. All right, so the deal is, uh, if you're going to take your first finger, you're going to place it at C sharp at the fourth fret on the fifth string, and that's going to be the natural three. The pinky is going to be at E there. That is the five. And the right hand is going to tap that G there. So all together, uh, you're going to tap. Pull off, sorry, you're going to tap it at the G, pull off to the open A string, hammer on at the C sharp, and hammer on at the E. And so basically it's got this up, down, up, down, up, 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 down, which is one of, one of my favorite sequences. That is to say, up is going to be, and they'll all start from the flat seven. This is a flat seven. One, three, five, and then the the down, that's a up is ascending, and the down is descending. And that's going to be flat seven, five, three, one. one. Flat seven, one, three, five. Flat seven, five, three, one. So it's going to do that two times. Then it's going to go up, up, two times, and then up, down, one last time. So you can think of the, there are four sequences, the one that's, Different is the third one. And we take all that business and we cut and paste that to the four string. And then I actually started to switch it between patterns. So let me let me see how what I'm gonna stick where. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it in half between the E. Let's see if I can hit the right note. Uh, so pattern number, uh, sequence one and two are down on low E string. Three and four are on the D string. I'm going to do the same thing for that last A and the last E. It's all together. Sorry, three, four. I changed it a little bit from the first time I played it. I'm only playing one A, one D, one A. E, D, A, E. So on and so forth. So that got us to our D, uh, or sorry, our, our, our A, uh, D and E dominant seven arpeggios played with two hands. All right. Uh, <laughs> well, the funny thing about that song, uh, Jerry the Vegan Rockstar, let's see what I'm going to do here. Am I going to get into a little bit of trouble here? Hang on a second. All right. You're going to get to hear a little bit of the song. This is the demo. It's before we actually recorded it in studio. These vocals were scratch vocals recorded with Caleb singing into the uh, his iPhone. I can't remember.
Michael. What's going on? Great to see you. Uh, so, uh, happy Easter to you, uh, and with great pleasure. This is why we get together. Thanks so much for hanging out, everybody. Chris, uh, pleasure is mine. That song is going to be uh, a lot of fun. We got a video in the can for that. Hey, Michael, great to see you, my friend. Okay, well, uh, I got stuff uh, I want to get prepared for for my day of teaching, uh, bring my students my best. Uh, but it, again, it's always a pleasure to hang out with you on a Saturday. Uh, thanks, Brad. With great pleasure. Thank you. I'm, I'm so excited. I'm working very hard crafting the right rhythm guitar parts to really do the best with these songs so they are the best they possibly can be, such that when people have the opportunity to hear them, that perhaps they will connect with them. Sean, happy Easter. God bless, my friend. Thank you so much. I appreciate you spending uh, your Saturday morning with me. Uh, Chris, thanks again, everybody. Oh, Tony Lucchese. Well, thank you. Appreciate that, my friend. Tony, uh, uh, a, a, a friend from the guitar camps, a student, a man that's in the midst of a house move. I hope uh, that that is going well, my friend, and also a purveyor of Georgia peaches. Uh, showed up at a gig in Nashville with some, some sweet Georgia peaches. So uh, just a lovely, at least I think they were, maybe they're, they made the Alabama peaches. I don't, where, I don't know where the peaches came from, but they were sweet and it was thoughtful. Um, so I am so grateful and so thankful to have so many people around me that are just incredibly positive and life-giving. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart to the top of my head. You have a great weekend. Uh, thanks so much. God bless. Uh, if you're celebrating Easter this weekend, um, you know, this is a special weekend. And so in any case, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, I hope it's awesome. Uh, we, it, I, I just came in here. Most of my tapping was in the middle and, and pinky. Um, I, let's see if I can do this without being obscene here. Uh, you know, and, um, to tell you the truth, there are times, oh, you know what? Hey, you know, I got a, I got a bonus for that. Hold on. There we go. Uh, so you can take those arpeggios. Sorry. That is right. Something like that. So that's now going. Okay, so. Ah, there we go. Sorry. Oh boy. I'm gonna do it with with with, uh, with one finger just because I get, I'm not gonna mess it up with my head. Oh, I, I know what I'm gonna do. Uh, when it's the double, I'm just gonna hit that one note. So it's gonna be. is that it's when you're doing the double in the same direction, the right hand doesn't move because it's just a little much for my little brain right now. But the idea is... My bad, I thought I could play it slow, right? It's this. Ah! That's easy for you to 
say. Ah! Oh, come on! Last time and I'm out of here. Thanks, guys. Uh, it's George. They were Georgia Peaches. Steve, happy Easter to you. Great to see you. Great hanging out this past week, my friend. Uh, Georgia has amazing peaches and awesome people as well. Eight finger nuclear power. All right, you guys. Thank you so much. Uh, it's got a groove. So, all right. Thanks so much, everybody. Make it a great one. I'll see you in two weeks. Again, thank you so much.